it really consists of two bits. One, more people are familiar with, it's the bindigewebe, it's the binding white sinewy fiber that you can see in all animals and certainly see in us. It's what you take off from around a piece of chicken or uh, yeah. the, the white lines you find in meat. Um, all of these things are the fascia. Many of these membranes are so thin that they haven't been taken up in science as being really important. But these membranes are the membranes that shape us. They shape us in embryology and they shape us in emotion. Uh, so they shape us in our life. Now, this this system, I have to stand up and change because this system is centered right here in your dantian. That's the center of your fascial system, which actually isn't a piece of fascia at all, right? The okay. center of your circulatory system is definitely part of your circulatory system. The depth center of your nervous system is definitely part of your nervous system. But the center mm -hmm. of your fascial system is just a point somewhere in front of your sacral promontory or the L5 body. So it's the belly button? That's the center? Well, that's close enough. But the center of gravity of your body is about four centimeters below the navel and a couple of inches in. Interesting. So the, the navel is certainly a developmental center, but if you take the, you know, if somebody goes off a diving board and goes, the center of gravity of their body is right and, in, stays okay. right in the center Got of it. the body. So that's the center of your fascial system is actually in the middle of your guts, <laughs> in the middle Dude. of your small intestine. Interesting. And then I saw, uh, I saw this Google talk with you where you, um, you had pictures And to me, that was mind blowing. Seeing pictures of fascia, it looked like slime. In like it, you could definitely see how it was holding it all together, and how the organisms were crawling on it to uh, affect it and to make it stronger and stuff. So when I see, I know we talked about chicken thing where you cut it off, and that's dead fascia and living fascia. Is there a difference to those in the way that you imagine it? Good, good, good question. It That's one of the things that slowed down the research on fascia is it was considered inert, dead material. Ah. Like, you know, you're not, when you open up a package from Amazon, ah. which we Americans do all the time, when you open up a package from Amazon, you're not interested in the plastic peanuts. You're interested in the thing that's inside the plastic peanuts. So similarly in anatomy, We went through the the peanuts of the body, which is this packing material of fascia, to get to the liver and the biceps and the other interesting things that we could find in it, and not paying much attention to the it that it was in. And you hit um, very well on that. It's not a dead, inert material. It is a very dynamic, changing, responsive material, your fascia. Um, we're familiar with the idea that you have lots of soldiers in your body. These are the white blood cells and the T cells and the macrophages, and they're going out to fight the invader and to keep you healthy. Uh, we're familiar with that idea, yeah? You also have about an equal number of gardeners in your body. They are not soldiers. They are gardeners, and they are gardening your fascial garden, I guess, you know, your your fascia. They crawl, or you said you saw organisms, but they're actually your cells, and they're crawling around the fascia, and they are clipping off the old dead fascia with enzymes, and they are laying down new fascia, and that new fascia is schleim. It is snot. It is mucopolysaccharides or glycoaminoglycans. There are long words for it, but essentially it is schleim, uh, yeah. such as you, or your body has lots and lots and lots of schleim. So we're familiar with the... Um, fibrous stuff, the sinewy stuff, the bindigeweba that makes up the fascial system and less conversant with the schleim that makes up the other half. They're actually a spectrum. It goes from the fiber over to the slime. It's not one and the other. It's mm -hmm. a spectrum that goes all the way through from bone to blood, uh, from very, very hard I tissue to very, very soft tissue. And the body can change the tissue uh, according to the needs because it's being gardened all the time by these fascial cells called fibroblasts that are the gardeners of your fascial system and your body. Again, <laughs> uh, a few of my gardeners have quit, and so my <laughs> uh, I, I, my skin is beginning to fall off, and I have to be careful with my joints now and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, for 70 years, they did, it did really well. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Fascia. Yeah. But you said you were 
75, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a pretty that's a pretty good job, yeah. You you've been taking I'm, good care of your fascia team. Yeah. Uh no, I have all of the usual habits and a few bad a few other bad ones, but uh I really like my work. I think that's why I'm yeah. doing it. Passion. Yeah. So uh you talked about the makeup of, of fascia is 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 hardly fibroblasts. Um what about something like collagen? How big of a role is that in in fascia? Okay, so we talked about the fibrous part and the slimy part. Collagen is the major one of the fibrous part. <laughs> it's a long, thin molecule. Oh, I don't know. But if I had a rope that was one meter long and one centimeter thick, that would be about the proportion of a collagen molecule. And it would look like a rope. It's three strands, uh, two proteins and a glycine wrapped up with each other so that it's a three-stranded rope. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's a little bit elastic and capable of twisting and untwisting. Uh, and we found that none of these fibers connect up end to end like this. They are all connected by overlap. So if I had glue yeah. or some sticky things in between my two hands here, that would do it. Now, the idea is that when you heat the body up um, by exercise or uh, if you can heat the body up locally with your pressure of your hand and then put a stretch on it, that these collagen fibers will slide along each other and then reform their um, bonds okay. sideways with each other. And in that way, you get an increase in length. This is called fascial plasticity and... Uh, you count on it to grow. You count on it to heal yourself and repair yourself. Um, but we haven't made as much use of it as we can in therapy and training. But that's basically how we become more flexible. Yeah. Well, the collagen is the, the collagen when it overlaps and gets really, really tight. It gets very, very unflexible. I mean, how how <laughs> how much time do you have to spend on your hamstrings to get them to yeah. actually be long enough to? Put yeah. your hands on the ground. It's uh, some of it's in your mind. Some of it's the muscle letting go, but some of that's the fascial letting go. And you can't talk your fascia into letting you go. You got to do it again and again and again, right? Just keep repeating and again, it. Again, or Chase. with sustained time. That's the other thing that the yoga people all talk about. Should you be doing it for thirty seconds? Should you be doing it for forty-five, ninety? Everybody has their own different ideas on this. Um, yeah, because that's another thing. Because I'm not that big of a proponent of yoga but I know you are um, because the way I see yoga is that you're doing sometimes an unnatural movement for a pr prolonged period of time and I cannot see how that could be healthy so I would like to hear your perspective on why yoga should be so good for fascia as you uh, as you say that it is okay um, well let me be really clear I'm I, uh, there are so many different kinds of yoga yes um, so yeah, yeah. you can't be for yoga because it isn't one thing Oh, sure. um, however, you, yes, you do hear me advocate for um, yoga a lot, but I, I really want it to be the small Y yoga in terms of people need to move. So I was very happy to see yoga go from something that was very obscure and not available to something that was available in every gym, in every street corner. People could find yoga because at least that was something that everybody could do and Secondly, now to get back to the fascia, it's something that employed that plasticity of fascia. You put a stretch on the fascia yeah. and you keep it on for a while. Let's see if I have something that would do that. Uh, and just like this plastic, it will stretch. So I'm putting a stretch on this plastic bag here and I'm sustaining that stretch like a yoga stretch for minutes and minutes and minutes. And I don't know if you can see it, but when I'm yeah. done, this this plastic is stretched. Yeah. You can wait all morning. It's not going to come back. Mm -hmm. yeah. so that's a plastic property as opposed to an elastic property. Yoga is good at stretching things for plastic change of length. Mm -hmm. yoga, is ter yoga, as generally practiced, is terrible for building elasticity. Okay. You find these people with all kinds of joint problems, et cetera, because, as you say, they've been putting themselves in unnatural positions and staying there for a long time. Uh, the idea of yoga is great. Yoga was not designed for 21st century people. It was designed for Brahmins 
uh, in the 1700s or 1600s, mm. something like that. Yeah. They say it goes back to Patanjali in the 3rd century AD. Okay, that's fine, but nobody knows what they were yeah. practicing back then. And yeah. besides, whatever they were practicing back then, they were practicing for an agricultural economy, not uh, an electronic economy. We need to completely redesign yoga for the 21st century, and then it won't be called yoga. It'll be called something else. Mm-hmm. So I'm not... I'm not anti-yoga. I'm not pro-yoga. I am pro-movement and pro-people doing different kinds of movement. Um, But I guess there's also another aspect to yoga, which is the spiritual aspect and the chakra aspect and the inner energy that is not movement-related, right? Or maybe it is actually movement-related. Okay, I'm not... I'm not commenting on that part of yoga at all. Whatever people's spiritual practice is, that's up to them. Yeah. Um, Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and yoga yoga comes along with the spiritual practice, but I was just talking about the physical the physical the movements themselves. Practice. Yeah, yeah, and and you know when I started in this, there was only one one yoga. There was Iyengar yoga from the seventies. We were all doing it, um, and now there are so many different kinds of yoga mm-hmm. that you can really take your choice as to what kind you want. There's the, but then that kind there's of even the... wine in yoga. There's wine in yoga in the United States, so. That's wine, okay. Yeah, yeah but you, then, try, you come, you play, <laughs> detox to retox. <laughs> yeah, it's become an industry for sure. But then that yeah. brings us on to saying, how should we move? Because we're living in a world where we're sitting down on office chairs, we're sitting in our car, we're taking public transportation, we barely even walk. Uh, I mean, people in general. And if you do, you really have to motivate yourself. We eat sugar and processed food. What is the perfect movement that we could do now? Let's say that, like, what should we all be doing? There isn't an all be doing thing. I'm sorry to okay. try to escape your question because <laughs> it's a good question. Um, but movement does need to be designed individually. I mean, we could, if, if uh, this is something I've been thinking about for a while, if, if you went into the schools and you said, I'm not just going to do repetitive exercise, I'm not just going to do competitive competitive exercise where we're you know have yeah. teams or individuals against each other and who can do the best. That's all fine. I, I don't want to take that away at all. But it it's the only way in which you can participate in movement. And uh, mm-hmm. I I go to schools regularly. Uh, first with my own child a long time ago, and then and regularly now to to visit with other children and. The amount of movement, uh, they don't even do recess anymore where you get out and run around crazily in the, outside the school. Uh, there, It's way too much sitting. I think ADHD is the sane <laughs> response to an insane <laughs> request, which is sit down all day, child. Yeah. And that, that's, not yeah. A, that's not a good request. So um, there, a, a wide variety of movement would be really great, stretching and bouncing and uh, mm-hmm. balancing and all of that kind of thing. I I, I hope that uh, by the time we get going here, this is a larger discussion, so excuse me for going into this for a minute, but we are having fewer and fewer children in the world, yes? They're, yeah. Yes, they're in the third world countries, population is still growing, but in the developed countries, population is leveling out if it has not mm-hmm. already leveled out uh, as it has in Japan, which means we are going to have, the children are going to be a more and more precious resource. Right? They've always been, a children have always been a precious resource, and but in the old days, if the child looked sickly, you put him out in the rocks yeah. or the wolves. Uh, mm-hmm. Only the strong survived in that kind of situation. 